Good morning, everyone. I just love you guys. I woke up praying for you this morning before 4 a.m. That's how much I love you. That's awesome. I felt it. Thank you, John. No, I really love you, and I'm so thankful that I get to be your pastor and that we are a family and we're a people and we're not a place. And Friday night was really incredible to watch people that didn't even sign up just stop by and got put to work. Right, Lonnie? It's true. It's true. And I want to shout out some people that are probably feeling a little weary right now on the heels of that living giving. The laws, if you guys know the laws, they're just so awesome, John and Jana. They not only served at the entire event on Friday, they also cleaned the space this weekend because they're on the facilities team. And then Jana is with your children right now, and John greeted this morning on the greeter team. So how incredible is that, like that they're serving the Lord? They're not doing it for applause, but um, I'm thankful for them. Another family I'm thankful for, man, the Weiberts, you guys killed it. They had both children, both babies, all right, at the event on Friday night. I came up to Evan. He's pushing the stroller. I said, man, thanks for being here. I said, there are a lot of other places that you could be on a Friday night. And he goes, yes, there are. <laughs> he said, just being honest. I said, no, I'm, I'm with you. I can think of a lot of other things to do on a Friday night. And till the bitter end, Mackenzie smiling, I kept checking in. Are you okay? Oh, I'm fine. But, you know, she's a mom. You know how moms are always fine. They can always make it happen, right? I'm so lame. I'd be like, I can't do this anymore, you know. Suzanne, just so awesome. She said, I might be in a wheelchair on Sunday, um, but that's okay. Tommy stayed till the very bitter end. I mean, how many kids' faces did you paint? Too many. It was so awesome, um, and again, it's not about the recognition or anything like that. It's just we want to extend what God has given to us, and if we can do that by just inviting people and letting them know, hey, there's a people that want to love you and welcome you the way that Jesus loves you and welcomes you. As it says in Romans fifteen seven, accept one another as Christ has accepted you so that God may be given glory. And the way he accepts us is that even while we were sinners, messed up, broken, didn't believe in him, he died for us and he welcomes us. And all we have to do is surrender to him. So with that out of the way, let's dive in this morning. You with me? So we're in this series called Marks of a Minister. Marks of a Minister. It comes out of Romans chapter 12. And here we read, starting in verse 9, all of these different attitudes and attributes. Things that are supposed to mark the lives of Christians, followers of Christ. We've already looked at several of them. It says, let love be genuine. The Apostle Paul, who's writing this under the influence of the Spirit, goes on and says, abhor what is evil. We talked about what it means to hate what God hates. God hates evil because evil hurts us and those around us. To hold fast to what is good, what does that look like? To love one another with brotherly affection and outdo one another in showing honor or value. We said that that word can mean value, that everybody has value. And then last week we looked at this one. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, and it goes on. And you might be wondering, okay, this is great. We're reading this in scripture. God is calling us to these things, but why? Why? Well, in Ephesians 4, we learn why. It says that God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Saint, by the way, is just a fancy word for Christian. We're called to minister, to be in ministry. And when we think of ministry, we think of what we did on Friday as just one piece of it. It's just one part. But ministry is when we serve people. Man, I could just go on. I was seeing Phil and Jen over there. They were there serving. I mean, just so many people serving 
And that's part of it, but it's not just serving them. It's then doing what? It's sharing the good news of Jesus. But here's what God understands, and it's why he had Paul write this passage in Romans. He knows that if we're going to share this good news as ministers, okay, we need to show the results of the thing that we're sharing. We need to show the results of the good news that we're sharing. So we've been working from this positional statement, if you will. It'll be on the screens behind me. You can't efficiently share what you don't effectively show. So if we're going to go tell everybody that Jesus loves them, we also should show that Jesus loves them by giving them things and serving them, right? See how they're connected? Ministry is about sharing and about serving. And we choose that word efficiently for a reason, okay? That's on purpose because we want good ROI, return on investment. We hope that those seeds we've planted do produce crops. But here's the deal. If we do a lot of sharing without a lot of showing, we're not going to get good results. It's not very efficient. So the way we effectively show is by consistently living out the gospel. And that also means... Not just doing all these things, but recognizing that when we fail, we can show people what it looks like to be forgiven, to have humility, and to grow because we're all in process. Amen? So we can be examples that way. I don't want you to think that this means we got to hit 100% all the time. Nobody bats a 1,000. So we're all in ministry. So today, I want to look at another part of that passage in Romans. And again, my notes are in that Church Center app. You can find all my scriptures there. You can find all of the information that you need there. And it says this, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. That's verse 12 of Romans 12, this long passage that we've been unpacking. I want to talk about that. Part six today is rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. What does that mean, rejoice and hope? Let's take it one word at a time, as we've been doing with a lot of these phrases, right? That word rejoice there in its original context, and its original language, it can actually mean to be glad. Be glad. I don't know if you notice this or not, but we love to get loud when we sing here, right? And we sing these big anthems like Battle Belongs. It's not a show. Right? We're stomping on the devil. Amen. Come on. I love the song, We Praise You, because it says, let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Like, doesn't that just make you feel powerful? Like, not because of your power, but because of God's power in you. His spirit, whom we learned about last week, right? And so we've got to get more rejoice-centric, if you will, as Christians. I think we do a bad job of this sometimes. Everything's so somber and contemplative. And I get it. There's a place for that. Emily always reminds me, hey, Alex, sometimes we need to sing the slow songs. Sometimes we're not always happy. I wake up happy, ready to go most of the time. But I've also dealt with really crippling anxiety. I've been depressed. I know what that's like too. But even in that, we can actually rejoice. The word rejoice, it means to be glad. To answer the question I set up earlier. It means to be glad. To be glad. And I've noticed that Christians lately have not really gotten a good rap about being rejoicers. Okay? We're very doom and gloom these days. We look at what's going on in our culture, in our society, right? We look at the moral decay of the world around us and the new sexual ethic that's reared its ugly head and come on, and we go, what are we doing? It's a disaster. We should be grieved and angry. That's right. But also, we act as though we're losing the battle. You know we win, right? I don't think some of you do. We win. It says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So maybe we should start acting like we're winning and not losing. Also, I want to say this. You're not unique 
and you're not special. And I know I've shared this before, but there have been other sexual revolutions. There have been other times in human history when what we think is acceptable and even praiseworthy is downright demonic and disgusting. Just look at the sexual ethic of Rome in the time that Paul is writing this letter we're unpacking together to the church in Rome. Men raping other men, children. Like this was normative behavior. Go read about it. It's not new. There was worship to pagan gods that included orgies, okay? You could pop in on an orgy and just have a little worship service, if you will. Crazy, right? We've got to remember this. Now, we look at what's happening in our culture, and we see the war, and we see what's going on, and it should grieve us, and we should pray. Do not misunderstand me. I shouldn't have to explain that we should care about Israel, but we do. They're God's people, and there are promises he will deliver to them one day. It shouldn't be so difficult to condemn terrorist activity, but apparently that can get you canceled now. What universe are we living in? But we also do grieve that there are innocent lives that are affected on both sides. That also shouldn't be hard for us to understand either. And we grieve for that as well. But we win. Let's start acting like it. Let's start acting like it. Amen. We've won. It's, it's already been written. We already know how this all goes down. We have hope today. And that's what we rejoice in. So, Pastor, I get it. We rejoice. We get excited. Fine. We're glad, I guess. But what are we glad about? Because again, you just listed a lot of things that should grieve us. So, so help me out. What do you mean we win? We have hope. Rejoice in hope. Here's the thing, though. This is kind of lost on us today in, in, in our world because we don't really use the word hope the way that the writers of the New Testament did the way that God uses the word hope, okay? So, so, so we use the word hope to, to really mean wishful thinking, right? Well, the weather app says it's supposed to rain tomorrow. There's an 89% chance of rain. I hope it doesn't rain, right? You're just tossing out some wishful thoughts. I hope that Pastor Alex's message isn't long today, right? Wishful thinking, Wishful thinking, unfounded wishful thinking. I just dashed your hopes, didn't I? Just trying to set some realistic expectations for the morning. But listen, that word expectations is actually more in line with what Paul meant when he wrote this word than what we think of when we think of the word hope. The word hope in scripture, it means confident expectation. That this is not about wanting, but it's about expecting. And when you expect something with confidence, you believe it to happen. I expect the sun will rise tomorrow, right? Unless Jesus comes back, and he could, right? I expect this. It's a confident expectation. Okay, so what are we expecting, pastor? Like, why are we able to rejoice in hope? Like, what are we rejoicing in specifically? Like, what is this hope? What's it tied to? What's it connected to? Well, there is an answer to that. And, and for that, I want to turn to another letter written by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. It's the letter Titus, or the book of the Bible, Titus. And it was written to a guy named, wait for it, Titus. Okay, crazy, wild. And here's Paul's opening to this man. He was a pastor on the island of Crete. Here's what he says. Paul, 
a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life. Did you catch that? Which God who never lies promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our savior. What's he saying? We have a hope in Jesus. This hope is of eternal life. In other words, we can confidently expect eternal life. It's not wishful thinking, it's a done deal. Why? Because Jesus promised it. And he will deliver on his promises. And so, when we realize that our hope is tied to eternal life, and not this life alone, then we can rejoice and be glad, even when we turn on the news and go, yikes. Right? Am I making sense? I need some more rejoicing up in here. Come on. We can rejoice today. We can rejoice today. Then he goes on in chapter 2 of this same letter, writing again to Titus, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, there's the word again, which is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't just die for you, didn't just save you, didn't just rise from the dead. He's coming back. He's redeeming all of this. There will be a new heaven, a new earth. Glory is what we call it. And it's coming. And in that, we can be hopeful. And in that, we can rejoice. And in that, we can be glad. Man, I need to preach this harder. Be glad today that this isn't it. Here's what's sad. There are a lot of ignorant people out there, and I don't mean that like in a derogatory way. They don't know the truth of the gospel, and they're acting like everything's great. No, seriously. And we have the truth that it gets better And we're walking around like, oh man, I'm worried for my kids. I'm worried for this generation. I'm calling some of you out. You feel it. Come on. We win. We've won. We have confident expectation that God is aware. It's not unique. We have a hope that everything we're doing now actually means something later when it actually counts. Because here's the reality. This existence is a speck on the timeline. It's a speck on the timeline. And so when we begin to take our eyes off of our hope, it's hard to rejoice because we go, "Uh uh-oh. Uh-oh. So, I want to say it this way. Hope is actually what we live for. This hope that the Bible speaks of is this hope that we live for. See, in, in Revelation 22, it's the last chapter of the Bible. We see these words from Jesus. Look, I am coming soon, he says bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. What we do now impacts eternity. What we do now impacts eternity. And then I want to read this out of Deuteronomy chapter 12. 
this is a story in Deuteronomy about God's people. It's primarily the laws he gave them, the people of Israel, okay? And their leader Moses is writing to them. He's speaking to them. He's telling them of the commands that God wants them to uphold as they enter this promised land, this land he's going to give them. He's delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt. They were slaves there. And now they're coming out of slavery. They're entering this place, okay, of promise. And here's what we read. These are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord, the God your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. And then they begin to be listed there. If we scroll down to verse 7 of Deuteronomy chapter 12, we read this one. And there, meaning the promised land, you shall eat before the Lord your God, amen, and you shall rejoice, there's the word rejoice, you and your households in all that you undertake. Did you hear that? In all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. In everything we do, we are called to rejoice. Why? Because God is in it. And God is there. And even when it doesn't feel like a blessing, it actually is. Because he's allowed it for a reason. I love this in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18. It says, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoicing is something we do always. So if hope is what we live for, rejoicing is how we live for it. One more time. If hope is what we live for, rejoicing is how we live for it. We live glad in light of eternity and our blessed hope, the appearing of Jesus Christ, who's coming again and who will judge us for what we've done in this life and how that impacts the next. So you're thinking, okay, that's great. I'd love some handles. How do I rejoice? If rejoicing is the answer here in my hope, I get it. There's a lot to be excited about But how do I practically do that? How do I live for this hope? How do I rejoice in hope? Well, I've got two observations that I think will help us with that this morning. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Let's pray. And then we'll dive in. Jesus, we need you. We can rejoice today in you because you're good. Because this isn't everything. Because our hope is the hope of eternal life. That there is so much more that we're living for than this speck on the timeline. Help us to see the world and and time the way that you do. Give us the grace and the ability through your spirit to rejoice and hope. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the first thing that we have to do if we're gonna rejoice in hope, is we got to find the hope. we got to find it. Well, you just told me about it. Yeah, but, but we actually, we can, we can find the hope of eternal life in, in, in our daily lives. Let me say that one more time. We can find the hope of eternal life in our daily lives. Paul actually modeled this in Philippians chapter 1. Paul's writing another letter, as he does, right? He's writing to a church in Philippi, and here's what he says, Philippians 1, 3 through 7. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you are all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, do you know how this goes? Will see it to completion or will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, he says. Because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in, watch this, my imprisonment 
and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. So here's what we learn here. Paul is writing this from prison. He's been arrested and imprisoned for doing the thing God called him to do, for living out that hope, right? He's trying to live for that blessed hope, eternal life, and he gets penalized on this side of eternity for it. But then he goes on in verse 19. Yes, and I will rejoice. See that? Even in this, I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Jesus actually says that that those who are persecuted can hope. Because the prophets in the Old Testament were persecuted. He himself goes on to be persecuted. It's not new. And by the way, we in America don't even know what that word means. Seriously. When you hear the stories coming out of South Asia next week, you will be even more thankful hopefully, than you already are today, that we do, at least right now, live in a place where we can freely worship Jesus. And we celebrate that. We rejoice in that. He says, with the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope. Right? Right? Because he understands that expectation and hope are tied together. It's not wishful thinking. It's a done deal. That I will not be at all ashamed. But that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. Whether by my life or by my death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account, he says. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So that in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. So Paul is finding the hope in his situation. He is saying, this sucks. This is hard. Truthfully, I'd rather be dead. At least I'd be with Christ. That's what he's saying here. That would be gain right now. That would be better for me than than still being here. But here's the hope. I get to influence all of you right now in this. And that will not only benefit me in eternity, because there will be rewards in heaven, but more importantly, my hope is that through what I'm doing, you'll be there as a result. That now eternal life comes to you because I'm still here. And he's finding the hope in what most people would consider a hopeless situation because he knows that what he is doing, writing that letter in that prison cell or under house arrest or whatever it was, okay, that that it would impact others for eternity. Because what we do now will impact later. Am I making sense this morning? So, In psychology, there's something called meaning-making. Have you heard of this? Meaning-making. I am going to let a doctor and expert describe it to you because I am neither of those things. This is an excerpt from a larger article, and this is a definition. Here's what it says. From the time you are developing in the womb until your dying day, you will experience many small and large injuries to your psyche. Your sense of self 
and your understanding of the world. Loss and trauma are two of the most injurious events that you will face. Trauma, whether childhood trauma, the trauma sustained during an abusive relationship, a traumatic event, or another form, and the loss of a loved one will affect how you navigate life. The meaning you make of these events will either weaken you or help you build resilience. Listen, the story you tell yourself about the events will either tie you to the trauma and limit you or help you create a life you love by giving you new depth and insight into yourself. See the differences? Psychologists call this process meaning making. The meaning you give to a loss or trauma can have a profound effect on your life. And we all know the people who have not done a good job of this and they're dominated by their loss and their hard experiences. But here's the thing. Psychology and all that it brings us is really helpful. But if it's not applied properly, it's very dangerous. Are you listening? So, there's a man named J. Warner Wallace. He's a Christian apologist. He was a cold case detective for years, and now he helps counsel other detectives and policemen and women who have experienced traumatic events on the job. And he said, here's the thing about Christianity, though. We should not be in the business of meaning making. We're in the business, watch this, of meaning finding. Because if we believe that there is a sovereign God who is in control, and as it says in Ephesians, is working all things to the counsel of his will, we do look back at our trauma, but we don't try to make meaning We go find the meaning that's already there because he's got a purpose for all of it. And that's a big difference because I've seen people go to counseling who have made their own meaning up. Let me tell you, it's pretty impressive. I'm just saying, we're not in the business of meaning making. We're in the business of meaning finding. And I've had counseling and coaching. I I am so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for that. But it's like I said last week, your accountability partner, your pastor, your coach, your counselor, they all should be informed by your helper who is the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth who guides you into all truth, okay? And ultimately, we can get all the counseling we want. We can revisit the trauma all we want. We can can talk to our pastor all we want. We can come to gatherings and groups all we want. But let me just tell you something. Look look at what it says here. If we want to find the hope in our traumatic experiences and in our lives and in the struggles and in the hopelessness as Paul did, we got to grab this, Romans 15, 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through the endurance and the encouragement of of the scriptures, we may have hope. If you have all that other stuff and you don't have the scriptures, you you don't even stand a chance in hell. You listening? And I've been in a really dark place. I've talked about it many times. And I had all these people helping me and working through this with me loving parents, an incredible wife, a coach, a counselor, all those things. Because the pastor needs accountability and help too, right? But it was the scriptures. That started at all and helped me out of that place. And I'll never forget where I was sitting and the day it happened, I was reading 1 John chapter 4. For we have come to know 
and to believe the love that God has for us. Abide in love, right? Whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. And the Holy Spirit, the teacher, as John puts it in 1 John, speaks to me in this moment through the word. It's how he works. And he says, Alex, you know, you know the love I have for you. You got to start believing the love that I have for you. And that broke the dam open and that started everything. And that informed every, every coaching session, every talk with my parents, every, every conversation we had, right? It started to inform my prayers and my preaching. I think there was probably three or four months of sermons where that verse made it in there. I don't know if you were paying attention or not. We did a whole series on it. <laughs> right? Because that we'll remember now. That's right. The scriptures give us hope. And when we get the scriptures in us and we listen to the spirit, he can say, hey, all that pain, all that struggle, all that, I got a purpose for that. And that's where we find the hope. And we go, oh, this actually all impacts eternity because now I see how I was brought through that. So this could happen and that could happen. And then that impacts this. And then that does that. And we begin to see it. And then once we find the hope, okay, we start spreading it. That's observation number two. We start spreading the hope. Because let me tell you, I didn't keep that revelation to myself as I just mentioned. Okay, we got to spread the hope. And actually, it's in the spreading of hope, even when you're in sometimes the hopeless situation, that you find the rejoicing and you can be glad. But the enemy wants you to believe that you're not healthy enough and you're not ready enough to start spreading the hope because you're not fully out of the woods yet. That's a lie. We're not out of the woods till we die. And once we get over this hurdle, there's another one. But we have the victory because it's not about here. It's about eternity where there will be no more pain and no more crying and no more, no more sorrow. I'm preaching this for my own self today. Because if we go back to Paul in that prison cell, Philippians 1, starting in verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. You know what he's doing? He's talking to the guards. Hey, you know why I'm in here, don't you? I was preaching about Jesus. Oh, who's Jesus? Well, let me tell you. I'm already in prison, so what do I have to lose? And he began to spread the hope in the midst of a hopeless situation. And in that there's rejoicing because in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says, I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them and its blessings. When we begin to let God spread the hope that we have in a hopeless situation, because we've gone finding it and we start rejoicing in hope in front of people, we're actually spreading it, whether we realize it or not. And let me say that one more time. When we begin to just outwardly rejoice in the hope we're finding, we will spread it, whether we realize it or not. And that brings me, as we wrap up today, to a story. I was wrapping up my degree I just got my dream job working at this large church in a suburb of Detroit, Michigan. I'm the worship pastor there and newly married to, just to top it all off, lots of change, relocating, commuting to school, being full-time, serving a church in that way, lots of responsibility, tons of visibility, and there was a person there at that church that really deeply impacted me. They actually were a mentor of sorts to me and didn't know it, probably. And it wasn't a pastor. It wasn't a teacher. 
it was actually a secretary. Her name was Dee. And she worked in the office, answered phones, cooked the books, all that good stuff. She had been working for that church for almost 30 years. And I would sit with her at lunchtime, her and the other ladies in the office and me, you know, because a lot of the other pastors would go out to eat and things like that. And I would try to go out when I could, but I was a broke college kid and newly married, you know, so didn't have a lot of money. So I'd pack my lunch and I'd eat with them in the office. And uh, Dee was super cool. She loved shopping. We always bonded over, over how we loved to shop. And she was always telling me about all the deals that were going on at the mall. And she drove, she drove a, a, a really fast car. And she, we, we like to talk about cars. Um, and in, in her mid-50s, um, she got cancer. And it was really hard. She'd come to work and she's so real. She goes, yeah, you know. Today's a bad day, threw up a bunch, but you know I'm here. Going through the chemo, lost all of her hair. She used to joke that she made her husband buy her a really expensive wig, like the really, like one of the really fancy ones. And that woman rejoiced in hope. She, she was always looking for ways to, to make some of us younger guys in the office, some of the younger pastors and guys on staff laugh and um, we would walk into rooms and she would like pull her wig off and like scare us. <laughs> she thought it was hilarious, you know. She'd always put her fake eyelashes on and everything, had a good time. And I remember, um, I, you know, shortly after the diagnosis and she'd started the chemo, we had a big um, Thanksgiving dinner. And I remember her serving hundreds and hundreds of people on that serving line. And she could not have felt well but she just served the Lord. And when I decided to leave the, the, the church and we were going to move to St. Louis, uh, she, she took me out for lunch and, and I just thanked her for her example to me. Um, she just never lost hope. And at 57 years old, she passed away. Uh, I looked up her obituary this morning and I, Put this in here. This is what it said in her obituary. D left a legacy full of serving, loving her family, and loving her God. She used her life and her battle with cancer to point people to God's goodness and his grace. She will be missed, but there is a peace that she is at home with Jesus. Colossians 127. To them God has chosen to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you believe in Jesus today, you host the hope of glory. And when you choose to find the hope in a hopeless situation and spread it, people just get a little taste of eternal life. It doesn't take the pain away, and it's okay to be angry at God. He, he knows, and I don't understand all the things and the wise that we might not know today but he's got a plan every every win every loss every sin every struggle he's in all of it and it says he's working it together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose we might not see all of it today but that's the beautiful thing. We don't just have today. And one day we will know in eternity. So will you find the hope and spread the hope? Will you rejoice today? That this isn't everything and that we're living for eternity. 
Amen, church? Let's pray. Father, as I prayed before, I'm going to pray again. Help us to rejoice in hope. Being glad that there is more to this life doesn't mean we ignore the pain or the reality of the hurt that is in our world and that we might personally be experiencing right now. But what it does mean is that we can recognize that this pain, this trauma, this hopeless situation, these hopeless situations that not only affect us, but those all across our world right now are part of your plan and that there is an answer and this isn't the end. Help us to live for eternity. Help us, Father, because as you said, you're coming back. You're our blessed hope, Jesus, the hope of glory. We love you and praise you in your name. Amen. I hope you've experienced God's love this morning. Now go and extend it. I'll see you next time. Thanks.